Good afternoon and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council program with guest speaker Zaza Muchamwa. Thanks to Ms. Muchamwa and to everyone who has joined us in person and online today. I am Peter Garalak, visiting assistant professor of international studies at the University of Iowa, a member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council board and chair of its program committee. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, members, sponsors, and partners for their support. This list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, City Channel 4 for providing online access to ICFRC's programs, along with the UI Library Archives. We also appreciate the support from the University of Iowa International Writing Program, which helped us to arrange Ms. Muchemwa's talk today. And it's kind of exciting for me on a personal note, because uh, until very recently, I too worked at the IWP. So it's nice to be able to collaborate yet again. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home of Iowa City, quote, now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. I would like to now introduce Zaza Muchemwa. She was born and raised in Zimbabwe, where she is a poet, playwright, and arts administrator. Her poetry has appeared in Penn International and Badilisha Poetry Exchange and included in the anthology Zimbabwe Poets for Human Rights. Author of the play The Fourth Interrogation, she is also an award-winning theater director and producer. Her journalism appears in Index on Censorship Magazine, Povo Magazine, and elsewhere. As a fall resident in the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa, she participates thanks to a grant from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Please join me in welcoming Zaza Muchemwa. Thank you, Peter. I would like to begin my remarks by playing a few songs from, uh, from home just for you to get an understanding of the sound from Zimbabwe and the messages that um, artists in Zimbabwe are um, sending out to the world and at home. So the first one I'm going to play uh, for you is uh, Tadzungaira by Forward Kwenda. So basically what he's saying is um, he's, um, the Mpira player is calling out to the higher spirits, to the ancestors, and saying we are wandering, we are suffering, we are going around with no direction. Um, and it's a traditional song that is still uh, resonant right now um, in Zimbabwe, Italy. The fact that a lot of Zimbabweans have had to leave home uh, in search of better lives. Um, and as a result, they either become second-class uh, citizens in those countries and or they exist outside of cultures that are prevailing within those countries, but also they don't also no longer belong to the culture within home. So being in that space of uh, in-between um, is something that a lot of uh, Zimbabweans are grappling with. The next one I'm going to play for you um, before the advert plays, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a song by Wingy D. Uh, he's one of uh, the most prolific um, chanters or singers uh, within the Zim dancehall uh, music genre in Zimbabwe. And 
uh, this song, when it came out, it became very controversial because we are talking about Kudira Jecha, which is something that was very common uh, on the streets in Zimbabwe in terms of, uh, it was a slogan for people who were um, dissenting with the status quo. So they'll say, oh, whatever we're going to do, we're going to pour sand into it uh, so that it doesn't work, uh, so that you can actually stop, stop and listen to us and pay attention to us. Uh, so he sang the song Kasong Kejecha as in the same song. Um, and the authorities, of course, they did not like that. So one of the things that it also talks about is it also kind of criticizes how at some point in terms of the currency exchange, our government decided to kind of just um, level everything and said, oh, our dollar is the same as the US dollar, so it's one is to one, even though it wasn't the case. Uh, and a lot of people lost their money uh, in the bank accounts. And also he's also criticizing that in this song that you say, if you're saying one is to one is the same, that's not true you are actually using the wrong kind of mathematics. And obviously when he made the video, this was after the controversy concerning the song had already started. So he had to be a little bit playful with the visuals and not be as very hardcore in terms of the message that he was sending out across. All right, um, yeah, which brings us to my remarks, which are not, maybe they'll be as exciting as Kasong Kejeja, who knows, we'll see. Hevoi Makadini, which in my language means, hello, how are you? I must admit to having been thrown for a loop immediately after agreeing to do a talk for you. Uh, bridging understanding between communities requires skills in curatorship and politics that I, as a writer, usually, usually do not have to call upon. I've had to take a few liberties in deciding what will be interesting at an international level and to North Americans in particular. In a sense, I had to transition into super user mode, which is the embodiment of one who knows what is best for you, like a god or a mother. So my disclaimers are, firstly, omissions are my own blind spots for which I would welcome enlightenment. And secondly, where I may come across as overbearing, I defer to the process. The speaker is obliged to be as assertive as possible and the temptation to be preachy can be overwhelming. After all, as writers, since the pandemic started, we've had fewer chances of seeing our audiences face to face. So I've got to make the most of it, right? You know, something about making hay while the sun shines, right? I'm pretty sure most of you know of Zimbabwe, the Southern African country that is often in the news for all the wrong reasons. In the interest of progress, I shall restrict myself to selective pilfering from history and my lived experiences to paint a picture of a country populated by a people who have aspirations just like you, your families, friends, and countrymen. I stand before you as a living and historical artifact. Like the USA, our history is intertwined with the British Empire. Like you, we disengaged from the empire over numerous reasons that are known. You as North Americans managed to liberate yourselves and went on to become the lead in Western norms of art, business, and science. We, on the other hand, are still stuttering and stumbling. Like you, despite this degagement, we still retain the English language and have slowly but surely made it our own. I mean, in Microsoft Office, you can, one can choose to spell check in the Zimbabwean flavor of the king's language. We thus are not a closed society. That said, we still retain, though tenuously, the Bantu languages, which are collectively, collectively spoken by people in 27 countries. We have struggled with our independence as a cursory reading of our politics and economics will attest. Whether this is simply ineptitude on our part or a more complicated global phenomenon is beyond the scope of my talk. What I can point to, however, is our identity. Before the men without knees arrived 
as we called the Europeans, since they wore trousers and their knees were not visible. We variously called ourselves Vanu in Chishona or Shitsonga, Abantu in Isizulu or Isitkosa, Abato in Sesoto or Setswana. This simply meant we saw ourselves as persons and did not distinguish ourselves according to language and dialect. The root word for person tu, nu, was the basis for calling the languages Bantu by Wilhelm Blick, a German linguist in the late 1850s. These languages are currently spoken by over 350 million people in Central, Southeast, and Southern Africa, just a little bit more than the population of the United States. That said, these languages are under threat from standardizing of discourse through use of English, French, and Portuguese, as the younger generations continue to lose fluency in them. Is it possible to have both or more of these languages at parity with the European languages? Yes. I grew up in the linguistic borderlands where it was common to hear one or more Bantu languages so multilingualism does not necessarily present a threat to indigenous languages in of and itself. This tool of my craft, language, can be used to affirm our common humanity or dehumanize and deprive life. Growing up, we were told, do not use such words because even though they exist, they can denigrate, mislead, or justify misdeeds. Conversely, we were encouraged to use words that bring people together and facilitate dialogue. As you are most likely aware, constructive dialogue in Zimbabwe has been in short supply, while polarizing discourse like labeling, distancing, have been amplified over the past 20 years. Granted, this challenge is not unique to my country or sub-Saharan Africa for that matter. The West faces similar challenges, though arising from somewhat different triggers like social media, climate change, and globalization. Such polarization is against our ethos as Zimbabweans, where we say, munu munu navanu in Chishona, or umuntu ngumuntu ngavantu in Isizulu, which sounds hackneyed, being the often quoted Ubuntu, who no phrase meaning, we can only be people amongst people, not isolated and alone, nor walled off in the bush. But this is not a worldview of absolutes. A leader still has to bow to his in-laws. A chief executive is still a child. A child is also a parent. And a parent will one day be cared for by their child in their time of infirmity. One does not thus have a fixed role. This depends on situation, time, place, and events. This that easily conflicts with immutable identities that set an individual as apart from a society and discourses that privilege rise without also emphasizing obligations. A manufactured irony and conflict thus arises when I, culturally, have to play a father role to my brother's children while playing a mother role to my sister's children. Even though circumstances can give impetus to viewing the family as a, fam as a nuclear family unit in the Western sense, Likewise, my brothers play a motherly role to my sisters and my children, so much for, you know, neat categories. Our identities are misunderstood as the ones who came from far away, arbitrarily assigned a tidy exonomic identity based on linguistic affiliation, as this was, was the only worldview they could understand and conform to their sense of order, being, and history. It is unfortunate that they and we ourselves assumed and sometimes continue to assume and use these fictive linguistic tribes foisted upon us as identities. Our current constitution recognizes close to 16 languages, many which are shared with Zambia, South Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, and Botswana. Identifying according to linguistic tribe is a tad problematic, more so in the old days when no hard borders existed. For illustration, my niece, a toddler, speaks four languages and recognizes another. Is she English, Hokkien, Mandarin, Shona, or Spanish? Not neat by any stretch. A tribal affiliation, though imagined, does not really exist in an authentic Zimbabwe imagination. It is only animated and can only gain valence and utility when weaponized to identify the political individual 
in the interest of confused, polarized, and rule. Instead, a Zimbabwean identity is untidy and complicated, with totemic affiliation being key. Totemic identification is an interesting phenomenon. With the exception of some Tonga-speaking people, we maintain an oral genealogy along the male line that crosses linguistic and geographical divides. It is an anchor providing an aspirational measure that lays claim to a collective identity, thus affirming an individual's humanity as part of society. It is also a repository of traditions, norms, and aspirations against which an individual is measured. To identify your pe yourself personally in those days of law did not require a stamped document or a seal or insignia. It sufficed to recite your family tree and totem and long forgotten or never known branches of the, fam the extended family would welcome you into the fold. Totems are also ways of affirming the good in you as we recite praises to those who have passed and mention none of their misdeeds. I can trace my, par my paternal lineage back five generations as I do not pay too much attention to this growing up. Typically, the totem is only disclosed to intimates or mutually when circumstances necessitated, necessitated knowing who the person really is, like traditional ceremonies or gaining admittance to a family. Individual names were either birth names based on topical issues at the time of birth, nicknames, fame or infamy or skills, and had no surnames. On the matriarchal side, I can only recite my genealogy to two generations back. Aside from the cognitive burden of memorizing two family trees, Perhaps this omission or minimization of the female line in totemic identification also serves to assuage the Y chromosome ego. After all, the mitochondrial DNA is a more distinct evolutionary pathway. This makes me wonder whether the people of old were far more aware of science than we give them credit for. My father sometimes jokes and says, maternity is a certainty, paternity is a matter of speculation. <laughs> A further complication is the education of everyone primarily through the English language and supremacy of the Roman, Dutch, and British common law variants that were carried over from the British. Individuals sometimes have conflict, conflicting ideas about rights, obligations, and personhood coming from oral traditions, totemic identification, language, globalized, globalized Western norms, and codified legal, legal systems. These identities can be quite schizoid in a sense. That, so, that said, my totemic identity acknowledges me with a different title and is a more consistent choice. So as young Zimbabweans, our ambivalent identities go tripping and struggling between the ethos we are taught by the languages we speak and the lived reality of isolation, alienation, unrest, standard progress, and regression. This comes through from the art scene as well as shall be elaborated later. Since independence from the colonial regime in 1980, Zimbabweans have had a tenuous relationship with politics and power. In the past two and a half decades, the society has been endure, enduring polarized discourse and a politically charged atmosphere. For example, this coming year, there are presidential elections, which mean that artists have to consider the political response to their work and consequently, their own safety. This is against the bedrock of a sustained economic regression where many people are unemployed with those that are not earning enough to sufficiently provide for their families. And the legal environment which prevails is firstly, Zimbabwe is signatory to at least two international treaties protecting intellectual property rights. However, the enforcement of intellectual property protections is lackluster which enables an environment where content piracy is normalized and rampant. On the other hand, the government, through its related agents, rigorously enforces censorious laws inherited from the colonial regime. Through these laws, books, plays, music albums, and gatherings, which dissent the status quo, have been banned. Whilst it is easy for creatives to make some sort of impact in Zimbabwe and gain audiences from home, Few artists have UK or US agents and as a result have a limited reach in bigger countries. Yet despite these political and economic challenges we face, the art scene is quite vibrant and artists are producing content at an impressive rate. 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about theater production. Community theater, which was birthed out of the confluence of our storytelling traditions and professional theater ethos, is a space for entertainment and intercommunal dialogue. Theater production within the community theater framework of 80s, 90s Zimbabwe employed colloquial language and was very responsive to the issues that the society faced at that particular time. Community theater opened the way for protest theater, which rose as the fight against apartheid in South Africa gained international traction. At the time, the government was fully supportive of the protest theater movement as it aligned with their goals of contributing to South Africa's liberation struggle. However, once South Africa gained political independence in 1994, the story was not the same. Protest theater became more inward looking, focusing on the situation at home, and started calling out totalitarianism, corruption, and misrule. Of course, the conversation between theater and the authorities became something entirely different. At the same time, there was an increase in young black Zimbabweans getting into the professional theaters to learn the craft and to also tell their own stories. Well, this, what this convoluted uh, paragraph is trying to bring us to where the theater production really is. I mean, there are several genres which are quite popular amongst current practicing artists, which include physical theater, protest theater, naturalism, theater of the absurd, and classical theater. However, most of it is mainly in English, a strategy practitioners use in order to gain a wider audience for their work locally and internationally which then leaves them out of the great possibility of exploring the untapped potential in local languages. The practitioners create in a space of tapping into the very specifically local towards creating authentic experiences for their audiences, using language to effectively get the message through to the masses whilst avoiding the keen eye of the censors. Censorship limits on what can and can go into theater. Productions are far and wide. Sorry, censorship limits on what can and cannot go into theater production are far and wide. For example, playwright Blessing Wungwe's Lovers in Time production at Harare International Festival of the Arts in 2014 was stormed by bus protesters who tried to disrupt the performance and the creators of the work were visited by men in dark glasses as the intelligence services referred to in the streets. This was because the play depicts Nehanda was a revered spirit in the narrative of Zimbabwe's liberation struggle, travels through time, and at one time appears as a transgender person. Such sacrilege could not let be. Theater is funded through embassies, international funding agencies, individuals, and sometimes corporate bodies. These days, grant-making schemes by international funding agencies are quite limiting. Most are targeted at young people between the ages of 20 and 35 years, and despite seeing myself as quite relatively young, um, out of the running of as a recipient for some of these grants. And sometimes the funder preferred themes are not always what an artist would feel they should be focusing on. Our music is very dynamic and responsive to the times. In pre-colonial Zimbabwe, music was used and created as an entertainment and teaching tool. During the liberation struggle days, music served as a tool for educating and boosting the morale of the povo. Music has certainly evolved to serve the needs of the masses as its workings are mainly in the hands of the people, except for a few instances where music is used as a propaganda tool. For example, the Hondo Yeminda album spearheaded by Professor Jonathan Moyo to advance patriotism of the Fast Track Land Reform Program. Today, one of the most interesting and positive popular music genre, Zim Dancehall, which is heavily influenced by Jamaican dancehall, reggae, and raga music, arises out of youth protest against political, economic, and societal challenges. Chanders, as the singers of this genre are known, Wingidi, whom I just played for you, and the late Soldier Love, are regarded as heroes amongst disaffected youth who see their lived realities, dreams, and aspirations embodied in groovy, free with little regard to typical musical conventions and societal norms in terms of subject, style, and PG rating. Before them, Mbira musicians Thomas Mafumo and the late Shoni Somaraire had already taken the, the Mbira beyond the traditional and proper to being an instrument of spiritual, visceral, and defiant exercise of deep musicality. Both faced the consequences of going against the system. 
Thomas Mafumo was exiled from home from, for several years. In retrospect, I remember a family expatriate friend playing to us music by a UK rock group who could not get significant airplay in their own country because their music was too leftist. It made me realize that discourse and this control is a challenge everywhere. Whilst there is the scepter of control over the land when it comes to artistic expression, there is a freedom for artists to create across cultural fixed points and identities. There are no calls about appropriation when artists sing in languages from what they're expected to use. For example, Gemma Griffiths, an artist whose ancestors immediate and past are of English origin, sometimes she sings in Shona, and those songs are quite popular in the country. Paul Matavire, a, a popular blind music, uh, musician, sang in Shona, Ndebele, English, and Kalanga, and no one could tell him which language he could use or not. And then concerning movies and TV series on YouTube, um, whilst developmental aid was instrumental to the growth and development of the local film and television, it did not help set up a resilient and sustainable ecosystem catering to diverse film and television interests. The recent granting by government of television broadcasting licenses to corporate bodies and individuals may increase diversity in television content. Both professional and amateur content prolifer... <laughs> I wrote this word. Uh, <laughs> both professional and amateur content proliferates in the film scene. The emerging film business model has started adopting the following strategies, which is one, placing content on streaming platforms like YouTube to gain ad revenue on streaming platforms since people have limited disposable income and the risk of piracy is high. And number two, shooting using low-cost digital cameras and phones. Number three, simplifying production processes with multitasking, similar storylines, and minimal use of special effects. And number four, focusing on niche markets rather than trying to make, make art accessible to the whole populace, which is a pity because even Shakespeare was meant for both the masses and the elites. However, all this could be improved on through training. One of the things that really also excites me about the art scene in Zimbabwe are the visual arts. Um, and aside from our politics, Zimbabwe is well known for stone sculpture and pieces are known for being high quality and very evocative and they're found far and wide across the globe. Currently, 20 large sculptures crafted by Zimbabwean artists uh, grace America's Hartsfield Jackson at Atlanta International Airport. Since 99, it has been attracting millions of people every year. Mixed media art is a, production, pro a progression of a can-do and work with what you have attitude. The medium is growing out of the innovation due to scarcity and expense of commercial art supplies. It contributes to the waste upcycling conversation. Within the different mediums of the visual artists, artists are able to use visual languages to capture the over-desensitization of Zimbabwean society and open the way to conversations that capture our humanity using the body, signs and symbols, sonic vibrations to point subtly to the ills within the society. It also praises people's resilience and strengthens our resolve to dream of better futures. One of the highlights of the visual art scene is the Zimbabwean Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, where at each edition, Zimbabwean artists astound visitors with the frontiers that their ex artistic expression keep getting to. This year's pavilion appeared in the top 10 of several lists recommending national pavilions to visit. So from everything that I have said so far, this is the context within the Zimbabwean artist works in of having grant funding avail availed with limits on age and attachment of preferred theme by managing organization, of always having to look out and think of their safety when making work. After all, the Zimbabwean creative does not have the luxury to uproot themselves from a dicey situation when confrontation between themselves and the system is escalated. Many of us are realizing that we need to be careful with how we use language that we need to find ways of being more inclusive in our interrogation of the status quo, for we are a part of our subject matter. The lives that we talk about, the struggles we highlight are a part of our immediate Zimbabwean experience. Some of us are realizing the need to broaden the scope of discourse and recognition of each other's humanity, which we can do when we, starting, when we start telling more small stories to be added to the grander narrative. This involves zeroing in on the histories, dreams, 
and aspirations of the ordinary women and men of my Zimbabwe. It involves knowing that no story is too small to be told and that your life as an artist matters, not because you can tell stories, but because you are here and now and you were meant to be present to bear witness to humanity finding itself and to always be in search of the nuanced in our expressions instead of the simplistic, which oftentimes alienates and shuts down conversation. And that as we record these small stories, we need to start crafting solutions which are relatable, which are scalable, which recognize the humanity in the other rather than divides. But all of this begs the question, why create anyway when facing challenges as we do? Because we are human. All humans have that spark of creativity, need to make, need to hear our own voices and see our own reality. This is a yearning beyond simply surviving and paying the bills. By voicing, we also affirm we are alive. By creating, instead of passivity and destroying, we remind ourselves that we are not useless. At its bottom, I also suspect an ache, a yearning to claim our voices, dreams and aspirations as our own telling our stories in our own voices and styles for ourselves. Because, well, cliche it is, hope, spring, eternal. Even at a linguistic level, we say, kare haagari arikare in Chishona, or kuzalunga kupela in Isizulu. Things do not stay the same. Sooner or later, it will change. Creating art is an opportunity to affirm life and affirm that life itself is change. I also think we possess a keen, rebellious, audacious, and obdurate spirit that protests and attests to its right to continue to survive, live, and make art. As the natural is the rising and setting of the sun, the waxing and waning of the moon, we continue to be and to do. Just breathing can at times be a sign of protest. Finally, I propose that we make art because we are possessed of a certain inquietude, an unsettled state of feeling and being, perhaps a rancor that there's got to be a different story out there, a different reality we can build, a vision that I and only I can paint. And what about me? The most I can say about myself shall be, who am I and where do I stand in this hodgepodge I just saved you? What am I doing here? Does an expose on the author elucidate on the text? I hope not. For I hope the ideas I spoke about go beyond my individual lived experience, otherwise they become irrelevant to you. We grew up in different cities, towns, epochs, families, and countries. Instead, I hope that my talk to you today has in some way built or facilitated a bridge between Iowa and the various places I continue to grow up in Southern Africa, and between men and women and everyone in between, and between children, adults, and ghosts, and finally between people, dreams, aspirations, and the world. Before I sit down, I'd like to thank you in your individual capacities for entrusting me with your attention, hopes, and sensitivities as I deliver this talk. This is more than any writer, performer, artist, and any other identity I lay claim to could hope for. Lastly, I would like to thank the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. State Department for having made my trip here a reality. I have had the chance to meet with very interesting people and I have had enriching experiences so far. Thank you. Okay, we now move to the question and answer portion of our program. For those in the room, please raise your hand. Uh, and uh, we're a small group, so we may not even need the microphone. We, okay, we've got one in back, great. Uh, I can come around and circulate the microphone if you have a question. For those of you who are watching online, you can text your questions to 319 600 2588. Uh, and perhaps to begin, uh, I have a question for you, uh, a softball as it were. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm wondering, um, 
As being a IWP fall resident, uh, you've touched on this uh, very briefly at the end of your remarks. I'm wondering what has your experience been like uh, being in community with other riders from around the world? And what has your experience been like so far uh, being in our community here in Iowa City? Great. Um, well, it has been a really great experience. Um, I've been meeting really interesting people, learning about their countries, learning about their craft. But I've also been, in a, been enabled to be in a space to kind of free myself up in terms of thinking about the work that I want to write about and what I need to focus on, so it has been great. But one analogy I can um, maybe give in terms of my experience has been, I think for close to like three days since when we got here, I would kind of like wake up immediately and say, is my phone charged? Let me put my phone on the charger. Because back home, when you have electricity, you make sure that all your devices are charged. But since, I, well, and for like three days, I kind of like was a little bit confused, forgetting that I'm in the United States where you have electricity all the time. And when I left home, we had these crazy power cuts where the power authority would put out a schedule but never follow it. So, <laughs> so you don't know when you have power and when you don't have electric power. So it was just like, I had to tell myself, Zaza, you're not in Zimbabwe right now. <laughs> you're in Iowa City. And I think after those three days, it was, yeah, it has improved somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, questions, uh, questions from the room? Hello. Um, you mentioned, I think, social media at one point during your presentation. I wondered what social media is like in Zimbabwe and how uh, artists use it to tell stories or share ideas. Um, well, in terms of social media use in Zimbabwe, we, it is, the usage is quite robust. Um, Zimbabweans have actually taken to social media immediately as soon as any new platform is released. They are on it. They are already trying to find uh, friends, family in different parts of the world because knowing that you have family in different parts of the world, sometimes social media also helps to kind of keep up to date with people and know what's happening in their lives. And on an artistic level, um, because I was talking about how censorship is used to kind of limit uh, artistic expression physically on the ground. Uh, artists uh, started using social media as a space to kind of, you know, if you record your skit uh, that is uh, in disagreement with the status quo and you put it on YouTube, they can't censor that, <laughs> you know. But of course, you still have people coming to you to have conversations about the content you're putting out there that is putting Zimbabwe in disrepute. Um, but yeah, so, because the authorities also realize that we have taken to social media to, to express ourselves very well and to connect with the wider world because uh, the Zimbabwean voice on social media is the alternate voice to what the official public messaging is like. Um, so they have also started um, crafting cyber laws to kind of prosecute people for posting on social media. Uh, there have been instances where people have been brought to court for uh, bringing the office of the president into disrepute by mocking the president or likening the president to uh, maybe a golem or something. Uh, so, so the authorities see and know that social media is something that um, can create a space for alternative narratives and alternate voices. So they keenly try to also kind of monitor that, but there is a little bit more freedom on so in social media than uh, in the physical space. I have one oh, let me, yeah, let me bring the microphone to you. How about that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Zaza. I loved your lecture um, what is your reception about the um, about the um, woman uh, in art scene and theater scene um, how is the situation is there how do you how do you see it well it has certainly improved over the years uh, before uh, in terms of production as in producer roles director roles those were mainly um, taken up by men uh, and as a result, uh, 
in a sense, I felt like the industry was in the hands of men who made decisions in terms of who makes the production, who doesn't. Even the theater, the theaters themselves right now, actually, the most uh, prominent theaters in Zimbabwe are still owned by men and still run by men. Uh, but then there are also alternative spaces that uh, people are finding to also kind of create their work. Um, and I'm happy that we have more female directors, we have more female producers uh, working within the space to tell stories that they um, are interested in. And it also helps in m also making sure that there is less uh, workplace harassment, if you get what I'm saying, when it comes to being in a male-dominated space and there's a young woman trying to, uh, to make it within the space. Uh, okay, Zaza, we have a couple of questions uh, from folks who are viewing online, the first of which is, uh, you said it's important to recognize the humanity in the other uh, rather than the divides. I could say the same thing about the U.S. What can we learn from Zimbabwe that could help us here? Wow. Okay, um, yeah. That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, and I, th I think when I was speaking about that, I was thinking more in terms of, instead of always thinking that it's an us and them situation, especially when it comes to those in power and us who don't have power, and those who support those in power and us who don't support those in power. It's just, um, okay, I remember one thing that a friend said to me. Um, he was saying, oh, after so many years, uh, some person who used to come to all my shows um, eventually approached me and told, and told me that, oh, uh, the reason why I used to come for your shows was because you were my assignment. <laughs> I was following up on you and checking on what you were saying and what you were doing. Um, uh, but, it is, but now I feel so ashamed for... Uh, uh, um, for having to do this job because you're a really brilliant poet, you're really amazing. And what he said was, you know, sometimes we are afraid of these people who are sent by a system to kind of suppress or to kind of control our narrative, but they are human. And because I kept performing and, and I kept focusing on the humanity, I was able to connect with this person on a human level. And I think maybe the United States can learn from Zimbabwe in that, as much as we have this polarizing discourse, uh, in terms of the ethos that we learn from our own local languages is that we see the person uh, more than anything else before we start having the larger conversation. And we try to see the person even if th those people sometimes are very brutal and <laughs> terrible. Uh, that's why even when a person dies who is part of the system, people don't come out to, to celebrate and enjoy because we realize that that is a person. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from a viewer online. Uh, please tell us more about um, how you became an artist uh, and what gives you hope? <laughs> this is a good one again. Um, so I became an artist by accident in, in the sense that when I was growing up, I was always, um, I was, I grew up in a house surrounded by books, music, film, like, and storytelling cultures from my grandmothers. But I never thought at some point that this is something that I could do for a living, even though I knew of uh, Zimbabwean writers who were making it big out there, even though I knew of uh, Zimbabwean actors who were also uh, having um, their moment uh, on the international uh, stage. Um, yeah, I think I remember one of the turning points for me was when I was 17, I went to watch a, pro a production at the local theater in Mashingo, and I watched this performance by these two South African artists, and it was just the two of them and minimal props, but the way they captured me, the way they held me in, in terms of their performance, I, I thought, this is something that I want to do. I want to do the same thing for other people. Um, and so it, so that seed was planted, and eventually I got into a place where I was supposed to pursue and go to university to study something else, and I got into a disagreement with my father because if I said, if I'm not going to go and study performing arts or creative writing, I'm not going to go there, and I'm not going to do that, and he wanted me to kind of focus on um, something more businessy like or professional. And mind you, my father is a writer, 
but also in academic. And maybe at the back of his mind, he was thinking, I've seen how the artist is treated in, my, in this country and how terrible the environment is. He was probably trying to look out for me. So we spent almost a year not speaking to each other except through my mother and my sister. Um, and then after that year, uh, he realized that I was stubborn and I was determined to do this. Uh, and then he started supporting me and kind of started also kind of giving me advice in terms of what to do in order to develop myself as an artist. Uh, and what gives me hope is that, uh, I, I think it's just the matter that um, if at the heart of what you do, you're doing it from a place of love and you're doing it consistently and you are um, doing it with all your grace and joy, um, you can make a little part of your world a little better. And that was, that's what gives me hope. Uh, I, I guess I have a question, sort of building off on what you've, what you've just shared. I'm thinking about young people in Zimbabwe who are looking to you now uh, and to the, uh, the artists that you shared with us at the beginning of your talk, uh, the, two, the two clips that you showed us, and the range of, uh, of art that's being created, and perhaps also in, in these dynamic spaces online through social media. And I'm wondering what kind of advice would you give to young Zimbabweans who are trying to decide if they themselves want to be an artist and perhaps also um, are considering whether they, um, they want to speak truth to power. Um, what advice would you give them? Okay, um, my advice will be identify the person you think is doing it very well in terms of whatever um, discipline you want to pursue in art and find a way of studying them, uh, connecting with them, connecting with their work. Um, and in terms of speaking truth to power, I think it is really important to speak truth, truth to power because if we are um, silent, then we are complicit, right? Um, but at the same time, it's important for you to stay alive, to, to also to, to breathe, to thrive. So as you speak to uh, th uh, truth to power, you also have to think of strategies uh, towards your own safety. Uh, you have to think in terms of how do I ensure that, uh, my own physical safety? How do I ensure my own safety on cyber spaces? Because also the system has been using uh, other uh, instruments to also kind of uh, target people online as well. So just be aware that uh, when you speak truth to power, there will be consequences, be ready for them, have a strategy in terms of how to survive that because we need you to survive so that you can continue speaking truth to power and telling stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the room here? Okay. Uh, and I don't see any other questions online. So uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to our closing then. Uh, thank you so much, Saza Muchemwa, for your excellent presentation this afternoon. Um, we don't uh, have one with us today, but we are very excited uh, and honored to present you with ICFRC's highly coveted mug, uh, which we will get to you very soon, which can be used uh, for coffee, tea, or the beverage of your choice. <laughs> we'll find you here on campus in a little bit. Thank you for joining us today, and... We are adjourned.